Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody. Um, we're very happy to see such a great turnout today at the launch of A Way Forward, a Made in Nova Scotia Home Energy Affordability Program. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the context in which uh, this report came about, and then Roger Colton will talk about the report itself and its recommendations, and I'll talk a bit about some of the elements in the report, but he'll talk about the recommendations. But before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the Affordable Energy Coalition has been working on this idea for as, as, as well as low-income energy efficiency programs for over 20 years, including Claire McNeil and Valerie Getson. Claire McNeil was with Dalhousie Legal Aid Service in the early 2000s and helped to set up the energy, the Affordable Energy Coalition. And Valerie Getson of Society of St. Vincent de Paul was uh, one of the one of the early members from uh, and has been involved for about 17 years so they are real pioneers in this kind of work and they were are here today uh, i'd also like to thank uh, minister tory rushton of the department of natural resources and renewables who enabled the setup of the energy poverty task force and uh, the DNRR staff member, Karen Daniels, was a great help in getting us going back in September. So we started meeting in September last year. There were, we pulled together 13 groups and about 20 individuals, including three Nova Scotia government departments, the Consumer Advocate, Nova Scotia Power, and the Oil Heat Association of Nova Scotia, Efficiency Nova Scotia, and CLEAN and the town of Bridgewater and three community-based nonprofits and a St. Mary's University professor. Uh, all of them are listed in the executive summary. So um, the report is a way forward. And uh, after we'd been meeting for several uh, months, we engaged Roger Colton, who is a leading expert in creating these kinds of programs to help low-income households with their energy bills. And he created a report called The Way Forward, the Made in Nova Scotia Home Energy Affordability Program, which is what we're presenting today. So again, just going back to how this all came about, I just want to remind you of 2022-3, which was a big year in energy policy and energy experience in Nova Scotia. Oil prices leaped. Nova Scotia power rate hearings were underway and led to rate increases for the next two years. The government responded in part to the public concern about these energy costs by introducing two new laws. And uh, they also, uh, towards the end of 2022, they increased the heating assistance rebate program from $200 a year to $1,000 a year. And they also increased the income thresholds. This was an enormous expansion and was a big help to people who were, who were struggling to pay their bills. In addition, the federal government and the provincial government were introducing programs to make heat pumps more affordable, particularly for low-income households, but for all Nova Scotians. So all of this was happening in 2022 and 23, and we um, went to the government and said, look, you're obviously interested in this issue. We've been interested in it for a long time. Why don't we set up a committee uh, to look at this, and they agreed to that, and they worked with us uh, since September. So that was uh, that was very encouraging. So one of the things that the committee did was we commissioned a survey to engage Nova Scotians on energy poverty, um, and this was paid for by Nova Scotia Power, which we really appreciated. And this uh, slide shows some of the results from that survey. So over twenty five percent of uh, those, these, this is a survey of, of a representative sample of all Nova Scotians and over 25% experience problems paying to have their home heated or to keep their electricity on. And of those people, 72% delayed paying for another essential service at least once, 61% build up uh, debt through a financial institution, 50% borrowed from family or friends. You can see all that information on the right of this slide. Um, and 63% experienced difficulty sleeping due to cold. These are, these are important 
not only financial impacts, but also stress and health impacts on people who experience difficulty with their energy bills. This is from the Roger Colton's report. So he did some background on the nature of energy poverty in Nova Scotia. So one of the things he did was looked at how prices have increased in recent times. And so this was uh, this shows what happened in the last five years. It doesn't include, this is for electricity, it doesn't include the increases in this year. Uh, this only went to, to last year. Um, so it's gone up even higher. And you can see there, there have been steady increases. And the, I like to, I'd like to point out that number at the top right, 176.6. What this means is uh, compared to 2002, which was set at 100, just as a sort of comparative thing, uh, electricity prices have gone up by 77%, which is pretty substantial. However, if you look at oil prices and other uh, fossil fuels, you'll notice that uh, prices have gone up even more. So if you look at the top right, it's three, 352. That means that oil and other fuel prices are 3.5 times higher than they were in 2002. And as this shows in recent years, especially in 2022 and 23, oil prices went up dramatically and they're very volatile. In this case, it was triggered partly by the Ukrainian war, as you probably all know. So another thing that the energy poverty, that the report looked at, Roger Colton's report looked at, was energy poverty in Nova Scotia now. And he used two different data sources. One of them, uh, I won't go in great detail into them, but one of them is a national survey that was done and set of data that was done by a group called CUSP. And uh, another one was uh, our own Efficiency One's energy poverty visualization tool. In the CUSP data, over 40% pay over, of Nova Scotians pay over 6% of their income on home energy, which is the definition of energy poverty. And a full 18% pay over 10% of their income and eight and a half percent or 30,000 people pay over 15% of their income on home energy. This is really quite striking. And one of the things that the efficiency one information pointed out or, or revealed was uh, that uh, this is spread, this, this, uh, these difficulties with energy costs uh, affect all areas of the province. It's, a, it's a somewhat higher in rural areas because of lower incomes and older homes, and it's worse in Eskasoni and Cape Breton. So uh, I'm going through these elements of the report pretty quickly. And so one of the things that it did and it after looking at, at the state of energy poverty in Nova Scotia was that it, um, it, it examined existing programs. So one of the programs is the Heating Assistance Rebate Program, or HARP. And it's, it has some really big advantages. It's easy to understand. It reaches many people and the administration is simple. And when I say it reaches many people, um, the number of people who applied with the increased amount in 2022-23 to $1,000, it went from about 40,000 people to about 100 and, uh, 150,000. So it was a huge increase because of the increase in the value of it. The, the problems with the HARP program is that it's only one payment per year. It's only during the heating season and it can vary from year to year. So it went from 200, that it had been for several years to $1,000 in 2022, 23, and then dropped back to $600 last year. So it varies from one year to the next. And it's not varied by how much a household is actually paying for their energy. And it's not varied based on income. Everybody gets the same amount. And then for emergencies and arrears, um, there are several programs, the heating assist, the home energy assistance top up, is one that's administered by the Salvation Army. Um, and then the income assistance also helps some of the, their own uh, people that they're assisting through income assistance when they run into tr trouble with their bills. And then private agencies also help, but there are problems with all of these. Um, 
the HEAT program is only available once every two years. Income assistance is often repayable. And basically we have a patchwork system that doesn't work all that well for people. And then another type of existing program are the efficiency programs that are targeted at low income households. Home warming is the most successful and the biggest program. It's for low income homeowners and it's been very effective. Uh, it has um, over 24,000 homes have been upgraded since the program was first piloted in, in 2007 or so. And the average savings are $860 a year for electrically heated homes and $1,700 for oil heated homes, which is really significant. That makes a huge difference to the homes that do get these kinds of upgrades. And there are other programs for uh, renters and also for Mi'kmaq communities, and those are very important but they can be uh, improved on. So now I'll hand it over to Roger, who will talk about the actual proposal that he, his report uh, is making. Thank you, Brian. And thank you to the Energy Poverty Task Force for inviting me uh, up to Halifax today to uh, present this proposal I developed for them. The uh, affordability program that I developed, uh, it can be called a universal service program, but the affordability program can really be divided into four distinct uh, parts. Each of these parts is an essential element of the program as a whole. It doesn't present a menu from which people can select that you could choose the bill affordability program and the crisis intervention and drop the rearage management program and the energy efficiency. The recommendation really is to develop the integrated program as a whole, uh, each of the four parts. The four parts are as follows. Number one is that there's a need to address bill affordability for bills for current service. The, that's on a going forward basis. The proposal is to reduce bills uh, by 50% to provide a 50% discount. Uh, th the question then becomes, well, who would be income eligible for those programs? And we had a lot of discussion about this uh, on the uh, or within the task force. And the decision was to use what's called LIM, which is the low income measure, which is a common measure of low income status uh, within Canada. And one of the reasons we chose to do this is because it's worked in other places. Uh, Ontario has the Ontario Electricity S uh, Support Program, OESP, and the Ontario Energy Board adopted LIM as the income eligibility measure. So given that it's worked in Ontario, we believe that it would work in Nova Scotia as well. And we recommend the, uh, or the proposal recommends an income eligibility set at uh, LIM. What that means, just to give you some examples, is if you live in a one person household, the maximum income would be a little over $27,300. If you live in a four person household, the maximum income is 54,000. $700. So LIM varies based on uh, household size. So for bills for cert, uh, current service on a going forward basis, the first element of the program is to provide a 50% discount. The second element of the program is what's called an arrearage management program. What an arrearage management program does is to provide uh, participants in the program a clean start. It addresses the arrears that those households or those customers incurred during the time uh, when their bills were unaffordable. And a rearage management program provides that uh, as customers uh, make payments, uh, make full payments on a going forward basis, that a pro rate apportion, a uh, uh, 1 24th a month over 24 months, uh, but a prorate a portion of their pre existing arrears uh, will be forgiven. Uh, they will receive a bill credit 
against their pre-existing arrears. It's really necessary to have an arrearage uh, management program. People don't receive separate bills, one bill for their uh, current service and one bill for their arrears. They receive one, uh, one unified bill that has both their bill for current service and their bill for pre-existing arrears on that bill. And uh, they're asked to pay that, uh, that whole amount. So it doesn't make sense to protect people against uh, the disconnection or loss of service uh, uh, on a going forward basis by addressing the bill for current service if people's bills are going to be made un unaffordable because they have arrears that they developed when their bills weren't affordable. And uh, so as people move forward, we will address uh, both their bills going forward and uh, also give them a clean start or a fresh start through the rearage uh, management program. As a general rule, a rearage management programs uh, say that as you make complete payments, we will forgive your arrears over either a 12 month period or a 24 month period. Uh, that's really a policy decision uh, that uh, will be made in the future. Number three is there needs to be a crisis intervention fund. Now you may ask why, if you're making bills affordable, do you need a crisis intervention fund? Aren't, aren't bills affordable? Shouldn't people be paying? Uh, their bills if their bills are affordable. But the fact is that uh, with the income qualified population of folks that we're working with, people not only have lower incomes, but they have what are called fragile incomes as well. They tend to be hourly employees. They tend not to have flexible work hours. They tend not to have paid leave. And so with this population of uh, of people, things are okay so long as things are okay. But there are many circumstances where life throws you a curveball and things aren't okay. Somebody can have a sick kid and miss two days of work because they have to stay home uh, with the sick kid. And when they do that, or if they do that, then they permanently lose two days uh, of wages. There will be crisis situations. Uh, there could be a major snowstorm, not that anybody in Halifax or in Nova Scotia has ever experienced something like that, where everything closes down for a day or two. And that's not only an inconvenience, but if you miss again two days of work, you lose two days of uh, of income, two days of wages, if you don't have paid leave or if you don't have flex time. And losing those wages would create or could create a crisis situation where you're unable to pay your home energy bill. So we need a, an element of the program to address those circumstances where uh, people are facing exigencies. Uh, people are facing non-normal circumstances that uh, create difficulties for them to meet their, uh, their home energy payments. And uh, we will have an element uh, to, uh, to address that. The crisis program that I proposed in uh, this universal service program is a year-round crisis program. It is not directed toward home heating. Uh, it is not time limited, meaning you don't have to, you would not have to apply for those crisis grants in a limited number of months, but you could access uh, that crisis because who knows when you might have uh, an extraordinary expense or a loss of income. And so you can access that crisis grant whether it's in January or May or July or September, whatever part of the year you're facing uh, your inability to pay. Finally, the fourth component is an expanded energy efficiency and electrification uh, element. Uh, there, there's no question 
but that the most efficient way to make bills affordable is to deliver energy efficiency services. The reason I say that is because when you deliver bill reductions through uh, energy efficiency, those bill reductions will occur year in and year out for years to come. The problem is that energy efficiency it tends to be very expensive. And nobody believes that, uh, that the province has the money or the budget to treat everybody who is in energy poverty with efficiency measures. So we need an expanded energy efficiency and electrification program but that is, and it's part of the answer to energy poverty, but it can't be the only answer to energy poverty. One advantage, of course, of having an expanded uh, energy efficiency program is that it reduces the cost of the total program. So if people have lower bills or if they have lower consumption, they will have lower bills. And if you have lower bills, providing a 50% discount on those bills uh, will cost uh, less money. So number one, bill affordability on bills for current service. Number two, providing people a fresh start or a clean start by addressing their pre-existing arrears. Number three, recognizing that uh, income qualified customers not only have lower incomes, but they have fragile incomes as well. So we need to be able to address crisis situations uh, or hardship situations as they arise. And number four is an energy efficiency component through which we deliver investments to reduce bills. The next slide, please. Now, the, the question is, what, uh, what impact will, will this have? and uh, on reducing energy poverty, because we don't wanna just throw money uh, at a program. We want to uh, uh, develop, and I believe I have developed, we have developed a program. It's a very rational program that will uh, generate the results that, uh, uh, that we're seeking. Um, and in, in this slide, I compare with the impact of the four-part program that I propose would be to the impacts of other previous programs or uh, or existing programs. The big program, of course, is uh, uh, the HARP program, which currently delivers uh, uh, annual benefits to income qualified uh, customers. Uh, a couple of years ago, HARP delivered $200 uh, per uh, participant or to per recipient of HARP benefits. And in doing that, it reduced the energy poverty in Nova Scotia from 43% of the population to 38%. So it has an impact, but it doesn't have a very uh, big impact. The impact, of course, became much bigger when the HEART program was expanded. So the program not only delivered $200 of benefits, uh, uh, in a year, but it delivered $1,000 in benefits uh, each year. And when it did that, it reduced the level of energy poverty in Nova Scotia from 43%, which is what it is without a program, to 23%. So that's a, a noticeable impact and a significant impact. That program, however, was uh, was unique and was short uh, short term in the most recent year, the HARP program has, has again been scaled back. So it delivers $600 uh, of benef benefits to program participants. And you'll see that therefore its ability to address the underlying energy poverty in Nova Scotia uh, has declined as well. Through the program that uh, I've developed for Nova Scotia, uh, by providing a 50% discount on bills for current service, uh, the energy poverty in the province will be 
uh, reduced from 43% to uh, 8%. Now you'll say, well, why why doesn't it reduce? Why didn't you develop a, a program that reduces it to zero? What this tells us is that energy poverty isn't only a low income issue, that energy poverty, and we uh, are finding that it's becoming increasingly so, is moving more and more into the uh, medium and moderate income uh, household. So even if we deliver these benefits to income qualified uh, uh, customers, there will be a portion of the population that uh, will will be facing energy poverty, and we will need to find other ways to address those uh, those moderate income households. Next slide, please. Now, the reductions in energy poverty that uh, I I just finished talked about uh, assumed what might be called ideal uh, conditions or ideal situations. Uh, it assumes that everybody who needs uh, the assistance knows about the uh, the existence of the program. It assumes that. Uh, uh, everybody who would be income qualified would, in fact, uh, apply for the program and uh, participate in the program. So, in essence, uh, it assumes a 100% uh, participation rate of those folks who are income qualified. And we all know that that's never going to happen, that uh, there will be situations where people don't know about the program. There will be situations where uh, people don't want to engage in the hassle of applying for uh, a program. Uh, there will be situations where uh, there are people who may have language problems or may have um, uh, difficulties in uh, uh, filling out the administrative forms. So. Uh, there are just any number of reasons why people may not participate in the program. So uh, I also considered, therefore, the uh, impacts of uh, an affordability program under what I call real conditions, under those situations where not everybody does apply for the program. Um, and uh, what the real conditions uh, assume are different uh, participation rates. And let me skip down to the uh, uh, the 50% bill reduction, the proposal that we're advancing uh, uh, here. Uh, if uh, only a quarter of the people apply for the, uh, the program, then the uh, reduction in energy poverty uh, is only 40 from 43% to 36%. Uh, now, the the response to that shouldn't be, well, that's not a very big reduction. We shouldn't do this program. The response to that is we need to do everything in our power to enroll as many people as possible. And there are innumerable ways to uh, uh, to increase enrollment in an affordability program uh, such as this. And so it's not okay simply to adopt the program and say, we're, we're finished. Uh, what is needed then is to adopt the program and then to engage in the outreach and engage in or uh, make the decisions that will facilitate participation rather than uh, impede uh, participation. One thing that we should remember in this last bullet is that the affordability program that I developed is not a replacement for HARP. It stands in addition to uh, uh, HARP. And so given that those two programs will remain uh, in existence, or the HARP program will remain in existence uh, uh, even after an affordability program is developed, we need to look at what the combined impact of those programs will be. And you see that the combined impacts of those two programs really uh, result 
in uh, a, a substantial noticeable reduction in uh, energy poverty in Nova Scotia. Before I move on, I just want to digress for a minute because I'm talking a lot of numbers here. You know, you reduce the affordability from 43% to 36% or 43% and 27% and so on and so forth. But it's important to remember that these aren't just numbers. I mean, we're, uh, these are real people that uh, we're talking about. When we, we reduce energy poverty from 43% to 27%, the, the percentage reduction are real people who are facing real difficulties, as Brian talked uh, about earlier. I was at a conference uh, uh, just a couple of weeks ago where somebody made the comment that uh, uh, statistics are numbers with the tears wiped away. And so when we look at the reduction in numbers, when we look at the change in the statistics, we need to remember that the statistics are numbers with the tears wiped away, that we're addressing real people facing real hardships. Uh, and that's the point of, of doing that. The, the numbers are simply a way to measure how well we are doing. So thanks very much to Roger for his uh, presentation of the actual proposals that he has made in his in his report, which was done through discussions with us, uh, people on the Energy Poverty Task Force, and looking at the actual conditions in Nova Scotia. So he's come up with some really excellent uh, recommendations. One of the things I'd like to talk about a little bit more that he had talked about was the impact of his proposals. The impact that he showed was what would happen if all the people in energy poverty were eligible for each program, and if 100% of them actually applied and were enrolled in the program. So these are kind of ideal conditions. What we did later was we also looked at the impact under real conditions so that, for instance, with the $200 HARP program, which existed for many years until 2022, we know that about 45,000 people enrolled, and that's about 24, 25% of households in energy poverty. So the impact, instead of being 30, going down to 38% from 43%, like reducing energy poverty by that much, the impact would actually be more like about um, going down to about 41%. It's not as big because not very many people actually enrolled in the program. Once the $1,000 HARP increase happened, the, the impact is quite a bit bigger because so many people actually applied. So that was 84% of the households in energy poverty applied for that program. So the impact under ideal conditions would be reducing energy poverty from 43% to 23%, but you have to adjust it a little bit because not everybody who was eligible actually applied. So we figure the impact would have been reducing energy poverty to about 26%. And similarly with the $600 HARP program, which has existed in its last year, the impact would go down from reduced energy poverty from 43% to about 34% versus 30% under ideal conditions. So those three uh, programs have actually existed. We know how many people applied. We know what the impact is because of knowing how many people applied. The next two, which are based on the proposal, we don't know exactly how many will apply because they haven't actually been tried out yet. So this is a little more of an, an actual estimate. So the 50% bill reduction, what we did was we looked at what the what the impact would be if everybody was eligible and everybody applied. And then we looked at the fact that uh, Roger has proposed that eligibility be uh, reduced uh, to 24 percent of those who are in energy poverty because of the low income measure uh, threshold. So the cutoff that would make people eligible. So about 24%, and then he's, he estimated up to 70% participation. So that means the reduction in energy poverty would be more like from 43% to 36% with that program alone. But it's much better targeted. 
It's for low-income households who have big bills that they that really create huge hardship. So it's it's a, a huge step forward if this is put uh, into place. And uh, what we would suggest is that the six hundred dollar HARP program continue to be offered for those who aren't eligible for this for the fifty percent bill reduction or who don't apply for it even if they're eligible. And if you combine the two of them, we figure the impact would be to reduce energy poverty from 43% to about 27%. It's a pretty substantial cut in energy poverty. And as I said, uh, it includes a much more effective targeting the, than the existing uh, $600 HARP program on its own. So very beneficial to introduce this. Now the Energy Poverty Task Force looked at the report that Roger did, and we uh, believe that it would make a real big difference in people's lives. It's a more targeted, effective approach, as I've said. It supports the government's goals like affordability for everybody uh, in this period when energy costs are very high and other costs are also, also increasing, like food and so on. So it's a very good way of tackling the affordability problems that people have. And it helps in the government's goal to get off coal by 2030. The reason for that is because if you're going to be making the transition to clean electricity, it's going to cost money and some people could be left behind if they can't afford to make the changes that keep their bills lower, like heat pumps and, uh, and efficiency or if they just can't afford whatever what the higher costs are. So this makes sure that nobody's left behind. And it's a very important uh, thing to keep, uh, a policy to keep uh, public support for the off coal program in our view. The other uh, way in which it supports government goals is that they, the government did uh, uh, commission the Clean Electricity Solutions Task Force which reported earlier this year, and they had a recommendation, uh, their 12th recommendation was that the government should consider a uh, low income bill assistance program like the Ontario Electricity Support Program. Um, and this program that we're proposing is similar to the Ontario program, but it's for both electricity and for oil and other, other fuels. And uh, so it supports the recommendation in that report. So we, Nova Scotia has been a leader in low income efficiency programs across the country for years. And we can also be a leader in low income financial assistance. And that's what we think would happen if the government accepts the recommendations in Mr. Colton's report. So thank you very much for listening to our presentation. We really appreciate your attention to this and we hope that you will support what we're, what Mr. Colton has suggested. And we look forward to working with all of you on that in the future. Thank you very much.